Good afternoon, all. This is uh, Michael Quill joining you today with Danny Pascal and Eric Jacobson. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about the pillars of modern data culture, people, process, and tools. So real quickly, from just a, a general agenda overview here, we've got uh, some really quick intros on the three of us today. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to Danny, who's going to talk about the democratization of data. Um, and then Eric's going to lead us through um, the role that change management and, and processes really play um, in this area. And then finally, I'm going to bring us home talking about how the, the cloud adoption framework is you know, fairly foundational um, to enable modern data. Um, from an intro perspective, I'm Michael Quill. I'm our Solution Director for Azure Management Services, or AMS for short. Um, I've been in my entire career in IT focusing on web and cloud infrastructure, application development and operations. I joined Catapult a little over seven years ago. Uh, that had various technical roles from an architect to delivery oversight, um, and then more recently moved into my current position as Solution Director. Dan, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Danny Pascal. I am a practice manager here at Catapult. Been with Catapult for seven years. Been doing um, uh, technology-based consulting for 20 years, uh, heavy in the uh, productivity space and data space. Eric? Hey, I'm Eric Jacobson. I'm a product success manager at Catapult. Uh, my role is to help our customers prioritize and manage delivery of data and AI solutions. Um, I've also worked as an enterprise implementation project manager uh, and as a product owner for enterprise applications, uh, as well as maturing and uh, supporting the maintenance operations associated with them once they're in production. All right. Yes, yeah, so I think I had talked to this one, Michael. Um, yeah, so just to get us started here, we're obviously talking about the three pillars of modern data culture, people, process, and tools. Um, you know, in our in our keynote address, you know, you, we uh, Irwin talked about how um, you know data is the number one workload going to Azure, and um, we're certainly seeing that in in you know the makeup of our pipeline over the last year or so. Um, the uh, and, and so I, th I think everyone understands and, and uh, why we have a, a modern data summit like this is you know everyone understands the importance of a modern data culture, but the the truth is there's there's kind of a growing gap between the the leaders and the laggards, and you know why why some organizations are are very successful at this and others are not is is really what we want to kind of dive in and, and talk about here. Um, you know, uh, one thing we've learned, and, and we'll kind of bring a lot of kind of what we've learned in, in implementing data solutions to this conversation. But you know, one thing we've learned is, is you can't just purchase new technology, roll that out, and, and expect that to be um, the catalyst for for changing your data culture. Um, there's just a lot. It's a lot more multifaceted than that. Um, it, you know, uh, Daryl in his previous session brought up this uh, new Vantage Partners study that talks about. Um, these pillars and you know ranks their importance in when it comes to driving a, a data-driven culture and and they point out that the people in the process um, you know account for as you can see over 90 percent of the effort in in moving a company um, to a a modern data culture um, technology is is not that primary driver um, so you know we're going to go we're going to go through all three of these kind of in, in that order, we'll talk people, we'll talk process, and um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of deep dive into the people, Eric in, into some of the processes we use to deliver data solutions and, and how we involve people in those processes. And, and Michael has some of that foundational technology he's gonna wanna highlight. Um, so with that said, you know, democratiz democratization of data, a term you heard Erwin bring up in the, in the initial session, um, it's, it's a popular term, but, but what does that mean, democratization of data? I mean, the key there is that, you know, we're talking about the entire organization. You need complete buy-in from top to bottom. Um, the, you know, what does that complete buy-in look like? You know, it, it's, I'm really talking about everyone. And so in order to get everyone on board with some kind of cultural change with an organization like this, it's gonna take a commitment 
from leadership. Um, the business is going to play a foundational role in ensuring that this is a, you know, a move to a, a modern uh, data culture is successful. Technologists, I'll talk on the type of role technologists will play. And um, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the key first movers or catalysts and how they can help accelerate that change. Go ahead and move to the next one. Um, so leadership commitment. When, when we're talking leadership, you know, the leaders will set the vision, which is important, um, kind of get it out, get the messaging out there that having a strong data culture within the organization is important. And, and, and that's a key starting point and it's useful, but what's most useful that we've learned in rolling out these data solutions is having leadership buy in fully and, and, and show that they're bought in. And, and where we see that is, you know, when it comes to decisions that leaders make, when leaders start um, pulling on their data teams to provide them more complex executive dashboards, for instance, better reporting and stuff like that, where everyone around sees that they're using data um, in new and creative ways to help them improve their decision making, that plays well with the rest of the organization. We've also seen that when leaders within their kind of corporate communications, you know, use data as a way of framing the topics that they're communicating, um, explaining where data provided some wins or how data was used to make some critical decisions, um, referencing data to justify decisions that were made. Those sorts of things um, help kind of push that data culture across the organization. And, and we've, we've seen where that works well. Um, when it comes to meetings, you know, uh, there are lots of ways to run meetings. We all have probably two meeting, meetings and would want to have fewer, but the fact that you've got a captive audience and all these meetings, it's just another opportunity to drive home data culture. And so meetings, you know, create a meeting agenda based on data. Uh, if you're, you know, planning something out, building a new plan, those plans should be based on data. Um, and when you're talking about, um, you know, building a meeting agenda, have that agenda focused on the data points and let the data kind of drive that agenda. And that that also, um, you know, is just another building block in the process of, of trying to push everyone towards a stronger data culture and being inclusive in that in, in such that you've got um, everyone from top to bottom seeing where data comes into play and how it can it could have a strong impact on day-to-day -day activity. Um, training comes, you know, when you're when you're trying to ramp up and be a more data-focused organization, uh, training comes into play. I'll talk about it in some subsequent slides here. Um, but when leaders show up to um, training associated with maybe new data solutions or um, kind of high-level data training to just push data literacy across the organization, when, when they see leadership participation in that kind of training, that also plays well. You know, some key roles um, that we see often when we're rolling out data solutions within organizations, often, you know, these, these initiatives are being supported by the CEO and with heavy input from CIO, the CISO, or the chief data officer if organizations have one. Um, and we're seeing more and more organizations hire that chief data officer and that person playing a major role in the um, type of uh, technologies that, that come to bear. Um, business participation. So, you know, leadership support is always going to be uh, important, um, but when it comes to business participation and data projects, we've found that that is almost irreplaceable. It's um, it's kind of where these initiatives start. It's, you know, we're, we're looking at solving business problems. So we need to work with the businesses, figure out what those key problems are that they need to solve, key optimizations they're looking to accomplish, and understand how we can bring data to bear to help them um, optimize or make these better decisions. You know, uh, the uh, having that um, business participation in our projects has been critical, but at a kind of higher level, you know, to to forge that kind of participation within the businesses, we're finding that, you know, it's making data accessible is 
is so ultra critical. Um, you know, first you've got to make it findable. It's got to be somewhere where your frontline workers um, know to find it, whether that's it surfaces in some dashboards or it surfaces in some uh, systems. Um, that's good to know. But on top of that, there's a kind of key foundational element in accessibility um, that's it's a threshold that's got to be crossed to really ensure that data culture is going to stick within an organization. And, and that is, you, you know, you've got to have um, that PII data, that HIPAA data, CGIS data, that's got to be secured. And, you know, your governance has got to dictate how that data is secured. So that's super important. But the data that, that, but that can't preclude end users from being able to access the data that they need to help them make de better decisions. So you, you have to secure what you have to secure, but making data widely accessible to users who need it, the type of data that they need um, in a kind of user friendly manner is is one of just the, the key cornerstones that we've learned um, to ensuring that this data culture will stick. And it's all, oftentimes you know, it's a foundational piece, but it's a very difficult one to get to. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, through some of these subsequent slides. Um, building data literacy across the organization, also very important. Um, you know, what this might involve data, you know, data dictionaries. So everyone is using the terminology the same way. Um, those are important. Training, uh, training comes into play here um, in, in kind of ramping employees up and understanding data concepts and data terms um, also you know but there's there's a limit to what end users can pick up from training and stuff like that that some of that they're going to have to learn on the job and to help them do that we've found it that it's been very important to have analytics capabilities embedded in core businesses and what that might look like you know um, sometimes that is data analysts attached to a business you know kind of a resource who's available to uh, folks working in a business, they can um, contact help. You know, if, if there's data that isn't already self-service uh, and readily available, they they could go to a data analyst, try to you know extract the data that they need. They could use a data analyst to help them interpret data, whether it be an analyst, an engineer, some kind of data professional, either um, tagged to a business or embedded with the business helps tremendously. Um, you know, we talk about um, training. We've, you know, a few things we've learned and seeing training programs roll out around data literacy is, is you know, kind of large training, centralized training efforts can be effective, but if the data solutions that are rolling out are rolling out six months, eight months subsequent to the training everyone took, that gap can, can create some um, serious adoption issues. It's no longer top of mind. A lot of the details have been lost. Where we see a lot of really effective training is that just-in-time training as things roll out, whether it be lunch and learns or um, carved out formalized training, um, having that training available as new data solutions rolls out um, seems to play better with the audience and stick better. Um, and as you're rolling out new data solutions, there might be skill gaps. You may not have data analysts embedded with the business, embedded with the business, or you may not have a, a large enough data team to support the solutions you're rolling out. Understanding those skill gaps and filling those is um, another critical success factor we found in, in um, rolling these data solutions out. Um, and kind of just taking us back to this last bullet point around business driven projects. I mean, this is really at the heart of what has made our rollout successful. Engaging the business early, helping them, um, helping them work through the requirements gathering process, understanding, you know, what they're trying to optimize, what goals they're trying to reach, um, what they're trying to achieve is it, is critical, but then involving them throughout the development and delivery process of these data solutions is just as critical. You need their constant feedback. You need their input. You need to know if you're continuing to hit the mark and you need to keep tying your progress back to those original goals. Um, and so having the business on board throughout that process of delivering new data solutions um, 
has proven to be critical in the, in the success of our rollouts. I mean, uh, Phil alluded to this um, during his earlier presentation around data maturity. You know, this this can't be an, an IT activity. It's got to be an organizational activity with uh, technologists teamed up with business users um, for these things to be successful based on our experience. Um, some of the key ro roles to consider when we're talking business participation, you know, we're often dealing with, you know, department heads, um, but some of the key roles that we see around data, having a, a, a strong solution owner who is engaged in the process in the process of building um, new data solutions is, has been critical. Um, having those users, those end users of a data solution available for testing and feedback is, is critical. Having a data owner and a data steward on board, um, you know, is critical in ensuring that from a technical perspective, those requirements are being met. And then ultimately you've, you've got people who are producing new data often within the organization, King and data. You, you need to understand, um, you know, what their challenges are as well to really provide a comprehensive solution that meets everyone's needs. So those are some of the key roles you'll see. There's more roles, but not an exhaustive list, but just some things to think about um, when rolling out projects. And Eric, who's gonna um, slide in after me, he, he'll kind of deep dive into some of the agile delivery processes we use to incorporate all these different folks into the process. I think we can go next slide. Uh, technologists. So yeah, when you're talking technology, so you know, in that initial slide we talked about how, you know, the technology is not your primary driver for success or failure, um, but technologists do serve a key role in in building data culture, um, and and in you know some of the key things that we see that that um, help help you know result in successful rollout you know, it kind of ties back to the business. Having the technologists stay true to the business problems, understanding what those business problems are, taking the time to learn enough about the business to understand what those business problems are and, and tying back the work you're doing back to those business problems and making sure you're still on the mark. Um, and like I mentioned, having the business involved in data initiatives is, is critical. So business needs to sponsor those initiatives and be involved in the kind of development and rollout of those, of those solutions. Um, embedding analytics capabilities in the core of the business, whether can happen in a couple of ways. You could have a, uh, one way we see this, there's kind of a hybrid approach where you maintain a centralized data group, might be an IT, and from that group, you know, they'll focus on your data governance, your data standards, making sure that everyone's kind of working from the same playbook, but then you have uh, decentralized personnel embedded within the business who are you know, following those standards and governance, but understand the business in a very intimate way that they can kind of, you know, work as a liaison between the technology and the business goals. Um, that seems to work really well. Um, I mentioned that, you know that uh, hybrid approach seems to work well sometimes you've got organizations they're, they're just more centralized and you your data team may all sit within the same uh, department maybe it and maybe those um, there's just key data um, analysts engineers who are tagged to various businesses to help there's there's other different ways to do it but the key there is to ensure that businesses have access to data professionals to help them understand the data and and bring it to bear for making better decisions. Um, so some key roles to consider when we're talking technologists, um, where where we see this coming to play with our projects. You know, there's usually a change approval board. We need to understand who's on that board and um, uh, what some of the key drivers are to to getting things productionized. Um, enterprise architects. Um, will play a key role in, in architecting solutions that are scalable and future-proof. Uh, central IT or federated I, IT project teams um, are involved from a technology perspective on all these projects, of course, and then you need to make sure you have your um, data custodians who kind of are these folks that have one foot in the technical side, one foot on the business side, um, 
and will ensure kind of who has access and, and play that maintenance role. Um, having, you know, when you have a, uh, when you're a modern data shop and you've got data governance standards in place, you know, having an auditor come in and, and audit uh, work in progress to ensure that those standards are being met is also pretty critical. Moving on, um, you know, when one way to accelerate the modern data culture evolution within your organization is creating some catalysts within the organization, some first movers, some folks who are data leaders within the organization. And when I'm talking about data leaders, I don't necessarily mean um, almost, these are almost never executives, but they could be managers, they could be frontline workers who have influence, but these are people who have influence with their peers and they will be able to lead by example. You know, they'll kind of be that bridge to both wor worlds, both the analytics side and the on the ground operations. Um, you know, I, I read an article where, uh, you know, they talked to uh, Jeff Lunau, a former manager of the Astros, and, and he talked about when he was turning the that organization into a data, um, a, you know, a data focused organization. When he would hire, he hired an, a new um, coach within every level, A, double A, triple A, and those people had to be able to throw batting practice and also code in SQL. I don't know where he found these people, but that was his requirement because he wanted those people to be catalysts for um, you know, improving data culture within the organization. And so he wanted new leaders, new kind of managers who uh, would come in and have that data background, but also have that, you know, operations background um, and be, you know, deeply steeped in both. Um, these folks, you know, will play a role in evangel evangelizing uh, the value of new data solutions to help make better decisions. And they can kind of perform you know, informal training with their peers, maybe formal training with their peers, but you're getting it from your peers, which is, I think, the key there. Um, where we often are able to help create some of these catalysts is during the, you know, development and testing stages for data solutions. You know, folks that we have tied into the project, end users, um, data producers, people who are going to go on and use a solution who are providing feedback during our kind of agile delivery process oftentimes make good catalysts coming off of that effort and you know embedding themselves with the organization and showing firsthand how to use the data solutions that are rolling out how to get full value out of them and and you know illustrate the advantages they're getting um, by using data in new and creative ways so just, just some ideas on how to, how to take advantage of your people and how to involve your people in all the different iterations of improving data culture. Um, so from here, we'll kind of start focusing on the actual um, processes we use to del deliver data solutions. I'll turn the uh, mic over to Eric here. Thanks, Danny. Yep. So, uh, as, as Danny pointed out, there are a lot of different roles involved in a, in a data culture uh, or even a data project. Um, and don't want to, you know, fail to underscore the importance of including all of those folks, especially the catalysts, people that are influential uh, amongst other parts of your organization. Um, but, you know, we've all had initiatives or projects where maybe not everyone likes to be voluntold to participate. Um, they might have some concerns or objections. You'll hear things like, um, well, I'm not sure we have enough time or uh, the data, you know, it has issues with it. And so it's not suitable for making decisions or concerns about whether the data you're talking about is a fair way to evaluate certain types of decisions. Um, that sometimes it sounds like uh, there's just a, a general, you know, uh, concern about change or a fear of change. Uh, maybe people are not necessarily comfortable with the new tools. Um, but 
it's important to kind of frame some of the skepticism as what it is. These are concerns that are going to serve as obstacles to accomplishing some of the things you want to as an organization. And really the best way to uh, bring those people into the fold is to include them. And, you know, again, if there's resistance there, you can say, look, this is an opportunity to have your voice heard so that you're involved in maturing the solutions, you're understanding how the sausage is made, how it's going to be used, and uh, better to have a voice in the process than to kind of be given the outcome and have to accept it. Um, as consultants, we've we've tried as many different ways as you can think of to accomplish this. And one of the best, and you'll notice we're borrowing uh, something from the software development space, but adapting it to data solutions. Uh, one of the best <clears throat> one of the best ways we've found to do that is through the agile process. Um, it's not a one size fits all or a you know a a cult or anything that you have to join. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to adapt it to different organizations. Um, but you know, just thinking about this topic and framing how we engage an organization on this journey reminded me of the Agile Manifesto, and it's a good intro to the process. So as Danny pointed out, uh, focusing on business needs, we want to keep the, the objectives in mind. So why Agile, right? It's a fair question. Uh, and the Agile Manifesto attempts to, to answer this. So we're uncovering better ways of developing, in this case, data solutions uh, by doing it and helping others do it. Uh, through this work, we have come to value. So this is not a, you know, uh, an edict or anything. This is a statement of values. Uh, individuals and interactions over processes and tools uh, working solutions over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. And as many of you may have been thinking as, as we read through this, just to state the obvious, while there is value in the items on the right, no one is saying don't do documentation, don't have a plan, quite the opposite as we'll see. Um, we value the items on the left more. And so this really, I think for me and for a lot of people kind of cements the idea that the best processes to achieve some of these outcomes are those that are as transparent and inclusive as possible. If you wanna move on to the next slide. Um, so the way we will often frame these engagements when we have a, a client who has identified one or more uh, problems that are worth solving in their organization uh, and are trying to figure out where to get started. And, you know, as uh, as someone mentioned earlier, um, you don't want to get, I think it was Sid, uh, get lost in the, uh, the art of the possible, right? There are a million things you could do. They all have value, but you have to figure out where to start and you have to have enough focus for people to be to feel like there's a plan. Um, so what we'll often do is tackle this in kind of a, a three-stage process. And one thing I'll point out here is this is kind of depicted as a, a one, two, three linear kind of thing. Uh, and it is, but it's something that can be repeated over and over again. Notice we're talking here about, you know, two to three months worth of delivery, right? Well, that's probably not gonna get you to your you know, to Nirvana from a data culture perspective, but it's a, a an opportunity to get some stakes in the ground, to have some short-term successes that you can celebrate as an organization, something to build on for other initiatives that you have in mind, and it's something that uh, you know you can use as a, an example in your organization to get others to kind of take the plunge and bring their ideas to the table. So. We start by just interviewing the different stakeholder groups. I love that term stakeholder because it just can encompass anybody. And here I want to be clear, we're not just talking about the technologists. Uh, we are talking about including the technologists, both from a 
you know, means of production as well as a what are your needs from a data culture perspective uh, because IT organizations are a business of sort and they might have their own data needs that they want to have put on the table uh, separate and apart from you know, learning the new cool tools. Um, and we just talk to them individually or in small groups of like minded people uh, about what motivates them, what challenges them, uh, what barriers stand in the way of using data to make decisions more, who their customers are, really kind of understanding the challenges and opportunities. Uh, then we'll have, you know, a couple of workshops, sometimes one, sometimes two, uh, depending on, you know, level of complexity and how many different groups we're talking about, where we bring those ideas back together and we work with people to understand in more detail and really socialize the idea with the other groups. What are the challenges? What are the impacts of solving them? Uh, what is the effort involved? Are there, are there barriers that would stop us from doing item C on our list right now versus maybe six months from now? Um, and we try to get everyone to the extent possible involved in the discussion about what is your roadmap and of your roadmap, what is what do we consider our minimum viable product? In other words, what can we bite off in a short period of time? Let's say two or three months, but it can vary um, to get some stakes in the ground and uh, build a foundation for what comes next. Um, and then number three, deploy the MVP is something that we'll talk a little bit more detail in more detail about in terms of how we uh, do that, but we're, we're saying what are the most important things? Let's go build them and then uh, if you want to take us to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how that works. So um, agile analytics is a, you know, a type of engagement that we will manage with uh, various customers and we are generally following the agile process. I'm not going to go into a, a deep dive history or a training on the mechanics of each and every agile ceremony and why they're important. But basically, we're focusing on interactions and individuals. What you see here is a, a circle representing an iteration. So let's say our MVP project uh, is two to three months, we think. Um, we want these iterations to be short enough to reliably plan because people are pretty good at planning discrete outcome, you know, delivering discrete outcomes over a relatively short period of time. Uh, and we want it to be long enough to deliver complete units of work. Uh, part of what you and your team will need to decide if you're embarking on this journey is what does complete look like in this context? Uh, generally speaking, what we prefer uh, to think of is something that can be tested or examined or reviewed at the end of the iteration sufficiently for your various stakeholders to provide feedback on it. Um, so coming out of that workshop, we've got our high level roadmap. Uh, we are ready to start our first iteration and maybe the first iteration is just getting some infrastructure set up or it maybe it is building out the features. Um, but we need to know enough about it to put together you know, a set of work items. Uh, this is usually referred to as user stories in Agile. And what's a user story? It's, it's a, a set of requirements stated very simply in terms of what do we want to accomplish? for whom and why, and what are the things that constitute acceptance criteria that are objective and measurable that say, I have delivered this user story. So um, one thing I wanted to kind of bring back uh, from, from Danny's presentation is super important for executives to set the tone, uh, outline organizational objectives, uh, make sure that 
what we define as our, our MVP fits into organizational strategy and act as a champion for those things. Um, but anyone involved, anyone with skin in the game, anyone with an opinion uh, can identify problems worth solving that fall into that. And you're going to want to keep the, the why, your reason, your business outcomes in focus. Uh, and flesh these items out until you've got enough detail to objectively validate those requirements. Um, I want to make sure it's clear too, we're talking business acceptance criteria. We may be talking about technical acceptance criteria, like you've, you've done unit testing, you, your uh, process is logging properly so that someone can identify acceptance criteria, which is, you know, as uh, some others talked about earlier, um, making sure that PII is uh, stored in a way that only people who should access it can and things like that. Whatever the case may be, uh, this definition stage is really where you want to have as much inclusion as possible across the groups in your organization. This is usually done, you know, once in these workshops and then once at the outset of each iteration you know a, tip, a pretty typical iteration is two weeks sometimes it's a month depending on processes and how long it takes uh, for a group to get things done and then you have your delivery team there with you those are typically your technologists um, estimating how much each of these units of work will will take in terms of time for the team to accomplish. Um, and then they're gonna build, deploy, and as often as possible, seek and get feedback. Um, if they don't understand something or if a question emerges as they're getting into the details of things. So that's another thing to sort of point out is uh, in our lower left quadrant there where we're developing it's not like everybody else goes away, right? But we know you're not going to sit there next to the developer, at, you know, next to their keyboard the entire two weeks or whatever it is. Uh, but what we try and do is have a at least a, a 15 minute stand up every day, sometimes shorter or longer, depending on the size of the team. Um, and sometimes it's just the delivery team and the product owner. The product owner is kind of the decider in terms of priorities and is the one who has to go and have all the fun sort of which problem is more important conversations with your various stakeholders so it's not like everyone has to be in those daily stand-ups but you should expect that while a team is working on something for a group that uh, for a group that you're part of or has a question that falls into your your uh, wheelhouse maybe it's security or whatever, that if they have questions, what they're going to talk about in that stand up every day is, what did I do yesterday? What am I going to do tomorrow or today? Um, and uh, do I have any impediments? Sometimes an impediment is a technical blocker, like uh, I need for Joe to be done with his piece before I can start on this other piece. But sometimes it is, I don't understand this acceptance criteria or um, this seems to conflict with some of our security policy, so on and so forth. So expect to have questions. And then um, at the end of each iteration, you're going to have a review at minimum at the end of each iteration where you're going to present what you've accomplished during that and get feedback. So that's an important process from a measurement perspective to make sure that every two weeks or however often it is you're getting input so that if your plan is wrong your plan could be corrected for the next two weeks um, and i won't spend a lot of time talking about about this but uh, agile process is great in that it can be scaled up for big projects but it can also be scaled down for keeping the problems that you've solved solved and managing maintenance and support requests for enhancements and so on so all these things are ongoing. Projects may have an end, but if you want your culture to endure, don't uh, don't break up the band at the end of the project. And 
think we're running a little short on time, so I think uh, maybe we can just skip this slide. And over to you, Michael. All right, thanks so much for that, Eric and Daniel. I mean, you obviously have deep dived around the, the process um, and the people which you know are um, so essential to really this modern data culture. So I wanna take a few minutes to talk about the cloud adoption framework as um, sort of a process and technology foundation that enables that modern data culture. Um, so we all know if we've been in and around the cloud that it's a journey, not a destination. Uh, you know, over the last seven years, Catapult has assisted our customers with their move to Azure um, in one shape or another following our own internal on-ramp methodology you see here. Um, this has obviously evolved over the years, um, most notably when the cloud adoption framework was released. Um, but overall, the, the journey from left to right, uh, moving from kind of understanding what the business objectives were to then actually deploying something in Azure and then, you know, managing an ongoing fashion have been fairly consistent. And, you know, with the unprecedented events of the last year, uh, we've seen an extraordinary push um, into the, really this managed phase for our customers. Uh, I mean, I think we, we've all seen how digital transformation has accelerated this year. And according to Microsoft research, it's likely to only increase um, here in 2021 by up to 80% uh, across all industries and businesses. And so what's so important about that managed phase? Well, if it's done properly, now the organization can use the Azure footprint um, to really deliver uh, the, the business workloads that the organization hopes to achieve. Um, obviously, we were talking about data today. We all know data is one of the essential drivers to cloud adoption. We've heard that in our session, we heard it in the keynote this morning. Uh, but it's really essential at this point in, in your cloud journey that you've got the people, processes, and tools all coming together to support that environment in a secure, governed way. And, and so I think this really gives a lot of our customers some concern because there's a high level of maturity required to effectively deliver cloud capabilities in a secure, um, optimized way. You know, we hear people talk all the time that they're worried about the security of their Azure footprint. Um, many of our customers experience an unexpected Azure bill or, or spending. Um, and then some just you know, don't have the team that can uh, properly support the, the Azure cloud operations. Um, so to assist our customers specifically, you know, we developed our Azure management services, which you know, at its core is really just our comprehensive cloud solution um, that has really evolved over those seven plus years of helping hundreds of hundreds of customers their, their journey to Azure. Um, you know, obviously it spans things like operations and security compliance and automation, but really at the core of it, um, you know, AMS is predicated on our advisory services where our architects give metric driven guidance and optimization recommendations for our customers. And then where it makes sense and, and where our customers need the help, we layer in some of the other uh, capabilities that we've seen be essential to effective cloud operations. So if, if you use a solution like AMS or you've built your own team, right, to really pull together those people and processes and tools to effectively manage uh, your Azure footprint. You know, many of us were told that, you know, life after the, the cloud adoption framework would be at the top of the mountain, right? We could start onboarding new workloads um, and all will be well. But, you know, in reality, what if that wasn't the case? You know, what if all that work had been done and now we're kind of at the tip of the iceberg? And so if you think about the tip of the iceberg being the, you know, effective cap implementation in your organization, what is the workload that's driving that scenario? We all know it is data. Um, that's why we're here today and tomorrow to talk about. And we've seen that with many of our customers and it really has spawned yet another um, prescriptive journey, if you will, uh, to sort of modern data support. You know, once you've got that secure landing zone and are ready for production workloads, we see our customers quickly move their, their SQL IaaS and, and PaaS instances um, into the cloud. And, you know, obviously if they can move to PaaS directly, many of our customers do, but if they're, if they're unable to, they, they uh, stop it at IaaS initially. Um, and then the real excitement starts, right? Now that they've got um, SQL capabilities in the cloud, they're able to take advantage of some of the advanced data services um, in Azure, things like, uh, you know, moving to Synapse to modernize their, their data warehouses. Uh, they're using ADF and, and Power BI to improve the reporting. Um, and then ideally they're moving sort of to that, that data governance phase with, you know, Azure Data Catalog or other tools um, so that they have that accessibility uh, that, that Danny touched on earlier that's so essential to really democratizing data. Um, this is sort of the, you know, the, the end all be all, if you will, of what we're thinking about is modern data. But I mean, we all know that's, that's not the last step, right? We've all been working with customers around, you know, predictive analytics and, and machine learning, cognitive services, IOT, 
and really that AI adoption, which invariably follows um, after those uh, the initial uh, transitional stages into the cloud, all of which is made possible by that secure, continuously optimized uh, landing zone that the CAF provided us. And I think it's important to note too, it, each one of these different phases, as far as the way to maintain and, and control those environments changes, right? Initially, you're worried about the core IaaS and PaaS services that are available in the cloud. Um, and then as you move into the sort of the modern data space, the you know, ADS specific capabilities and, and big database services are, are really um, what you're, you're focused on to ensure that those different, you know, those different pipelines, et cetera, are, are functioning properly. Um, you know, I don't want to steal any thunder from some of my colleagues, but uh, David Vanderslice and Ron Joy are going to do a presentation tomorrow about DevOps for data infrastructure um, that I'm sure you know, any of the technologists and, and maybe many of the business users uh, on the line today would really enjoy. Um, and then finally, it's sort of a, a cutting edge space, uh, the ML ops one is, um, is one where you know, you're kind of moving into that, that place where you're using the AI capabilities of the Azure suite and, and really need to understand um, how you operationalize that. And so when you think about tooling that's available um, in, in the Azure cloud, I mean, there, there's, there's tons of them. I think last year's Forrester Wave had 25 plus uh, AI ops based tools. Um, and they're certainly, they're, they're wonderful, they're, they're great. But you know, we as a team stopped and, and thought about it. And you know, if you think about the $20 billion that Microsoft spent in 2020 on R&D, many of which, most of which is on the cloud, you know, does it really make sense to discount the, the native capabilities of Azure and the inevitability of Azure kind of being the, the best solution? Um, and so we stepped back as a team and, and thought about this. And you know, thanks to the ability to refine code in the Azure REST API and, and really using log analytics as an integration point, um, you know, we recognize an opportunity to create a uniform, repeatable pattern uh, that allows us to configure, monitor, and enforce um, within our clients' environments. And so we built on um, log analytics and incorporated some of the native tooling of Azure, you know, Security Center, Monitor, um, Azure Policy, et cetera, um, along with uh, infrastructure as code to develop this sort of baseline configuration and monitoring and governance tool for our customers. You know, taken together, we, we can monitor, we can alert, we can remediate, uh, we can even enforce via this Azure-based solution that we call Everwatch. So that was originally designed as a, a definition uh, managed application uh, for our customers' tenants. And we've kind of evolved that as the Azure platform has evolved uh, for service providers um, to take advantage of some of the, the capabilities with Lighthouse. So I think, you know, from a capability roadmap and, and what we see with our customers is sort of what we've taken with, with Everwatch. You know, we started with sort of those core IaaS pass capabilities, things you might expect, you know, obviously VM statistics, uh, app services, some of the you know, application gateways and, and front door, et cetera. Um, and then obviously as our customers moved into this, this data space, we have quickly followed after with uh, additional capabilities around Azure SQL, uh, around some of the, the ADS services, you know, uh, data factories, um, data lakes, uh, Databricks, and of course, uh, Synapse as well. Um, and then finally, uh, with the emergence of organizations need to really operationalize their machine learning, um, we have moved in that, that direction as well to look at some of the things around ML compute, um, pipelines, you know, connection monitoring, um, and really model drift, which is a pretty complex topic. But I think if, if you're interested around sort of the, the evolution of machine learning operations, um, you know, Lee Harper and, and Ron Joy are going to give a great talk about that tomorrow. Um, and ML ops taking machine learning from from lab to production, which, as I mentioned earlier, is really sort of a, a cutting edge um, space. And so, you know, obviously, I, I've spent a brief amount of time here talking about some of the the technology processes and tools that um, help facilitate a, a modern data culture. Um, but you know, as Danny said at the top, that really is a small percentage of the challenge relative to the the people and process. And so, obviously, we appreciate your time today. And and you know, if you think about you know, as an organization, if, if you're struggling to to locate the problems we're solving, um, you know, that's really so, sort of the strategic focus of our innovation workshop. Um, these are designed to really be flexible and meet you where your organization is, whether you're, you know, just getting started in the cloud and, and your data journey, or if, you know, you're uh, well along and are looking to do things with some of the advanced capabilities around um, AI, et cetera. Um, and so obviously this is a great opportunity. We would welcome uh, the opportunity to speak with you and your teams about how we could help you uh, move uh, along on your modern data culture. 
And with that, uh, I'll go ahead and open up to uh, to any questions from the audience. I'm not sure if we've had any in the chat. Doesn't look like we have any questions in, but if you have any, please send them in or you can raise your hand and you can unmute and ask yourself. It's like we just got one in, Michael, in the chat. Yep. Uh, how do you ensure the security controls while still driving the democratization of data? That is a good one. Um, Eric, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you had sort of uh, skipped over a little bit about your self-service example. Yeah, so I mean, uh, first, I, I think there will be some conversations around that in our next session, so I don't want to dig too deeply into it, but um, so stick around if you're uh, really interested in security controls. But uh, at a very high level, um, you know, you want to start by classifying your data so that you know where uh, different types of data you have that has risk uh, to it um, resides. Obviously, you want to make sure everything is encrypted and uh, contained so that people within your organization can access it. People outside can't. Uh, and there are a lot of things you can do with role-based access controls uh, and, uh, and different groups within uh, Active Directory where you can give different entities within your organization uh, access to uh, mostly the same data sets, but restrict them from some of them. If, uh, for example, you know, HR needs everybody's social security numbers, but other people don't. Um, and then there are other sort of controls around uh, what they can do on various devices uh, and what they can't do to make sure you don't have data exfiltration risks from and people pulling up reports and saving them on their smartphones, things like that. Thank you for that, Eric. It looks like we also have a question from Allison. Um, and we can certainly share a, a PDF of the presentation um, after today, Allison, for reference. Yep, and as this uh, session was recorded, I believe you'll also have a, a recording of, of it as well. Yeah, one bit of color on the previous question, you know, it's as important as it is to secure your, you know, critical data, um, it's just as important to make data accessible to those who need it. So it's a it's a tough balance and it's it's a it's a subject hard to answer um, quickly, but it's maybe uh, totally worth sticking around for the deeper dive security conversation because there's a lots of ways we deal with that, including role role based access. Well, if there's no other questions, we really do appreciate your time today. If if you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, there's a, a survey here. You can scan the QR code or it's also in the chat. We'd love to hear um, your thoughts and your feedback on um, this afternoon session around the, sort of the, the people, process and tools um, that are foundational to that modern data culture. And we uh, we know you've learned a lot thus far um, and, and hope you stay with us. I, I think there's a lot of great information to come. Um, and as Eric and um, Danny just mentioned, the follow up here is our um, sort of top five tips around securing your data, so. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys.